As Commander in Chief, I have determined that it is in our vital national interest to send an additional 30,000 U.S. troops to Afghanistan. After 18 months, our troops will begin to come home. The U.S. President orders another significant troop deployment, a strategy for victory, or a prelude to abandoning Afghanistan to another civil war. This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the program. I'm Nick Clark. More troops and a timetable for withdrawal. In 18 months, U.S. troops will begin to pull out of Afghanistan, so said President Barack Obama. The exit date, part of his long-awaited announcement detailing U.S. strategy for the ongoing war, which began back in 2001. Now, that strategy has three core elements. 30,000 extra U.S. troops will be deployed in the first part of 2010, ahead of the start of a handover to Afghanistan forces in July 2011. Now, those forces will work with NATO, the UN, and the Afghan population to pursue what he called a more effective civilian strategy and create a partnership with Pakistan, recognizing that success in Afghanistan is directly linked to security over the border. We must deny al-Qaeda a safe haven. We must reverse the Taliban's momentum and deny it the ability to overthrow the government. And we must strengthen the capacity of Afghanistan's security forces and government so that they can take lead responsibility for Afghanistan's future. Well, joining us to discuss President Obama's new strategy, we have Sebastian Gorka, a military affairs fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. He's in Washington, D.C. From Kabul, we have Marwas Yassini, the deputy speaker of the Afghan parliament. Uh, and back in Washington, Cheryl Bernard, the director of the Alternative Strategies Institute. Uh, welcome to you all. Mr. Gorka, I'd like to start with you, sir, if I may. Uh, the Taliban, as the Absolutely. Taliban have been saying, extra troops just means a bigger target to shoot at, doesn't it? Well, that's, that's a very cynical way of looking at things. If you look at the fact that the commander on the ground, General McChrystal, in a version of the report that was edited by the White House uh, when they removed the numbers. He actually, in the first version of his report, he said, I need more troops. I need between 20 and 60,000 troops. Uh, here we've had a decision to assist the commander in the ground. Unfortunately, it's less than half of what he requested, but at least the commander is being given more capabilities to execute a counterinsurgency strategy. Uh, Cheryl Bernard, uh, we're certainly going to see elevated casualties, aren't we, while offering no guaranteed uh, chance of success? Look, it's a complicated situation, and it's not like there was a perfect solution and, and he found it or he did not find it. There's certainly a gamble involved in this. And I think the important thing to keep in mind is that there are a lot of moving pieces here and a lot of actors. The U.S. is not the only player that's going to make a difference here. What's really going to be important is how do the other regional states behave and how do the Afghan people themselves behave. There's been focus on the Afghan government, but it's the population as well that's going to play an important role here. They're going to have to decide what kind of a country do we want to live in. As well, the regional actors will have to decide do we want to continue playing games with this situation or are we going to try to stabilize it in the interest of everyone? Okay, Moas Yassini, in your view, is this extra deployment uh, the correct uh, path to take? Well, uh, actually, the extra deployment was needed, but it is part of the bigger strategy. It has to be part of the very bigger strategy or a very bigger picture. The only two deployment is not enough, number one. Number two, I mean, the strategy has two dimensions. One dimension is uh, the internal dimension of the United States. President Obama uh, uh, did a very good campaign for him in order to elaborate that how many troops is needed in Afghanistan and why that is needed. And he had a comparison with Vietnam. So that campaign was very, very good. But the regional or uh, the, 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 the ground reality in Afghanistan is much, much com more complicated. I mean, uh, this strategy, as President Obama elaborated, will be not enough, particularly the deadline for the withdrawal will collaterally uh, boost the, 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 the moral of the enemy because if we give them the deadline that we are not anymore there and we are after 18 months starting to withdraw from Afghanistan, so that will, will boost their moral uh, effectively. But the president needs some kind of exit plan, war. doesn't he? 
Well, he did, but I mean, I, 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 if, uh, if I was one of his advisors, I would not have given him the advice to give the, the months or days or weeks. So, uh, because that is directly affecting the moral of the Afghan forces, the moral of the international forces here in a negative way, and that boosts the moral of the enemy here. And I think the time frame is not enough for the, uh, to build up the Afghan forces here. I mean, we are looking forward to have a couple of hundred thousand a national army, uh, about 100,000 Afghan police. I think it is incredibly difficult uh, to have by uh, within that uh, time frame the the the, uh, the troops to be the Afghan troops to be prepared in order to to uh, carry on with this war or or defend our cities in particular our capital. Okay, let's bring in uh, Charles Bernard there. Uh, this idea of beginning a pullout in 18 months' but time is just not realistic, is it? Right. Look, he faced a dilemma. We all face a dilemma there. On the one hand, this is an asymmetric conflict where we know that we can't just, we're not facing like a, a battalion that's standing there waiting to fight against us and then we muster more men than they have and we win. It's not that sort of a situation. Typically, in an asymmetric conflict, if they feel they're outgunned, they just wait it out. So it's correct that by giving them uh, information about our planned exit strategy, we're basically telling them, well, okay, take us on if you feel you can, you know, cause us some, some trouble. But but if you feel you can't really take us on, just wait us out and just you know, disappear again, dissipate into the countryside and come back in 18 months. That's the one side of the story. On the other hand, however, if we don't create a timeline for this, the, the neighborhood will just say, well, great, this is the U.S.'s headache. Let's let them, you know, let's let them fight this battle indefinitely and bleed themselves out in terms of, of, of human costs and, and financial costs. They need a wake-up call. They need to know that in 18 months it's going to become their headache, and they need to start acting responsibly and play their part in making Afghanistan work, which they're not doing at present. So, so that's the dilemma, and there really is no other solution. There had to be, this had to be what he did. Absolutely right, uh, uh, Mr. Also, Gorka. Also, I'd like to say that... Second, let me just put that to Sebastian Gorka, if I may, uh, in Washington. Uh, Mr. Gorka is absolutely right that the, the Afghan government uh, needs this, uh, this stick. It has the carrot, and now it needs the stick. It needs this deadline. Well, to a certain extent, a message had to be sent to Kabul that they need to step up to the plate, as they say here in America, and take responsibility more than they have done in previous years. However, there's a fundamental issue that wasn't addressed anywhere in the speech, and that's the fact that sovereignty truly cannot be exercised by Kabul in some kind of federal fashion across the whole territory of Afghanistan. Uh, apart from a very short period in the 1970s, this country did not function in a way that is comparable to modern nation states or federal systems of government. Unfortunately, and, and I know the U.S. State Department doesn't want to hear this and other members of the U.S. government, the fact is that sovereignty in certain areas of Afghanistan especially along the Pakistani border, is not exercised by Kabul. It's not exercised by federal forces. It's exercised by tribal leaders. And that's what I was expecting from the speech, some kind of recognition that, yes, there are problems with the Karzai government, there is corruption, there's lack of numbers or commitment to the police forces and the, and, and the uh, armed forces. However, this will not be solved by federal government alone. It must involve some kind of quid pro quo, some kind of bargain being, being struck but in a three-way uh, arrangement between Washington, Kabul, and the tribal leaders who have exercised sovereignty along the border region for centuries. And I didn't hear that last night, and that's why I was disappointed. Uh, Maurice Yusini, were you disappointed not to hear any reference to that issue? Well, I would like to agree to a certain extent that what is present here in Afghanistan, I mean, there are warlords, there are not very good governance, but, but I would like to say one thing. This is not only our war. This is not only the Afghan war. This is the international community war against terrorism. We inherited here. We were, we were given the power in 2001. I mean, we had here uh, in the sense 2001, but who is responsible? I mean, the only Afghans are not responsible. I'm not talking about the Afghan 
current government or the government since 2001. I'm talking about the Afghan people. The Afghan people were not given enough opportunities or there was uh, the, the international community did not work on democracy. The international community did not work enough on the development. The international community did not pay enough attention to tackle the corruption. We have a stake. The international community is a stake. We are selling the same boot. And this thing goes beyond our borders, beyond the region even. It goes, I mean, this, this, this war, was, uh, war came here from the Western Europe, from the United States, from the, from the, from, uh, even from Indonesia, where the terrorists, uh, okay. where the terror... Mr. Yassini, I, I'm going to just jump in there, because yes, we're going to talk about uh, other countries' involvement in this whole process in just a second. I just want to focus on Afghanistan just for the time being, what's happening within, because President Obama did emphasize uh, the importance of involving ordinary Afghans in the process. Let's have a listen to this clip. We will work with our partners, the United Nations, and the Afghan people to pursue a more effective civilian strategy so that the government can take advantage of improved security. This effort must be based on performance. The days of providing a blank check are over. President Karzai's inauguration speech sent the right message about moving in a new direction. And going forward, we will be clear about what we expect from those who receive our assistance. Uh, Mr. Gorka, uh, Mr. Obama there not mincing his words about what he expects, but uh, will it reap any dividends, do you think? Well, I think it's, I mean, it's just very optimistic to keep talking about the Afghan people will do this, the Afghan people will do that. I was in Afghanistan a few years ago, and it was very clear to me that the concept of Afghan citizenship hasn't been established yet. You have a country of more than 14 languages, numerous ethnic groupings, tribal groupings, and so forth. The only institution, the only um, repository of an Afghan identity at the moment is the armed forces, ironically. Beyond that, you have all kinds of different identities. So the idea that people are going to say, yes, I'm an Afghan, I own this problem as much as the president does or as much as the international community, uh, doesn't reflect the reality on the ground. People who, who first see their loyalty as to their village, as to their tribal leader, as perhaps to their ethnic group. That's the reality in many parts of Afghanistan. So to make these comparisons to Western concepts of responsibility lying in a social contract of being a citizen of a nation state, Afghanistan isn't there yet. Maybe it doesn't want to be there yet because it has a rich history of other ways of identifying oneself and citizenship in a federal nation-state concept is not one of them yet. Well, let's put that to uh, Gerald Bernard. How do you approach this problem right. of grassroots? Yeah. Well, actually, I think that it's been astonishing the extent to which Afghans do feel themselves to be Afghans. Unlike Iraq, where you had a very strong uh, centrifugal uh, dynamic in place, where people talked very seriously about splitting their own country up, you won't find any Afghan uh, of serious numbers supporting that idea. It's very clear to them that they want to remain one nation in spite of their various ethnic differences. Of course, identity and uh, you know, affection and so on is always local as well. That's, that's true in, in any country. But the other thing that I think that last statement overlooks is that there has been a significant amount of change within the country over the last years that it is important not to miss. First of all, you've got a younger generation that is very much oriented towards the rest of the world and modernity now and change and prosperity and all of that. At the same time, you do have a very significant grassroots building of democratic institutions and democratic understanding. For example, in this network of over 22,000 community development councils that are elected locally, that follow a very democratic procedure, and that can be a very healthy network for, for building up this national identity and notions of good governance. It's important, yes, to work with the tribes. Those structures are still in place. But it's also very important to realize that there are new structures in that country that we need to address and tap into, too. And I think that Obama's speech did open the door to that. Okay, uh, Mr. Gorka, your response to that briefly, if you will. 
Uh, I just think that the concept that we're all one world citizens and that the Afghans, the new generation, is going to save us from the insurgency that's raging through parts of that country is, is just not reflected on the ground. I think we've got uh, decades of, of, of violence to undo. We've got l a lack of institutional grounding across the country. And we've got huge problems that the last eight years have done little to solve. And I think the idea that we can simply import concepts from Western culture uh, doesn't cut it uh, in, in terms of Central Asia and especially in terms of a, a tribal and ethnic milieu such as Afghanistan. Okay, I want to move it on a bit. I'm just anxious to get on well, to uh, Mr. Yusini's point of, of uh, you know, responsibility yourself. that lies abroad. Uh, sorry, Cheryl, we'll come to you in just a second. But uh, President Obama also talked about uh, Pakistan, of course, uh, this issue of Pakistan and how important it is to involve Pakistan uh, in the whole process, how crucial Afghanistan's neighbor is in all of this. In the past, we too often defined our relationship with Pakistan narrowly. And those days are over. Moving forward, we are committed to a partnership with Pakistan that is built on a foundation of mutual interest, mutual respect, and mutual trust. We will strengthen Pakistan's capacity to target those groups that threaten our countries and have made it clear that we cannot tolerate a safe haven for terrorists whose location is known and whose intentions are clear. America is also providing substantial resources to support Pakistan's democracy and development. So, Myros Yusini, uh, easy to say he would not tolerate a, a safe haven uh, for terrorists whose uh, whereabouts is known. What do you make of that? How realistic is that statement? Well, uh, uh, Pakistan is very, very important in this context. Uh, of course, the region is very important. We cannot alienate geographically in this case of terrorism or, or this uh, phenomenon present here that to, to isolate Pakistan from Afghanistan. But I hope uh, the approach of the implementation of the strategy of uh, President of the United States, uh, Mr. Barack Obama, has to be very practical. We have to follow up every step that how we do implement jointly Afghanistan, the United States, and Pakistan, the strategy against terrorism. If, 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 if the, the I was kept blind on many realities here, in the regional context that will be make it further complicated. So every uh, step has to be followed very carefully and we have to, to, to implement the strategy. Only the wording will be not enough. However, I completely uh, agree with President Obama from this point of view that Pakistan has to be included in the, the attention has to be paid to the other side of the border. Okay, Chair Banal. Well, the aperture needs to be wider than that even. It's not just Islamabad. We have to have Moscow on board, Tehran, New Delhi, all the surrounding countries that are players in this, either behind the scenes or overtly, need to be on board as well if this is going to work. Okay, uh, Mr. Gorka in Washington, um, it was interesting what uh, President Obama was saying about Pakistan. I mean, he seemed to be alluding to this concept of, of cooperation. I mean, to what degree do you think he was upping the ante there? Well, I think finally we're getting closer to what really is in Washington, the, the unmentionable elephant in the room in, in the last six months. And that's the understanding uh, amongst people who, who are dealing with the counterinsurgency efforts in Afghanistan, that, that Pakistan is priority number one here. You really can't solve Afghanistan, you can't stabilize it without first thinking about what the second order and third or four order effects are going to be in Pakistan. And the issue here is this, this virtual country of pa uh, Pashtunistan, which has been cut in two by the British Durand line. And here we have an issue where we finally recognize that there is a razor's edge along which Islamabad is walking, which is intertwined inextricably with the Taliban, the Quetta Shura, and Al-Qaeda, and the future of Afghanistan. Uh, the speech wasn't strong enough in terms of emphasizing the fact that uh, with uh, Pakistan, that is where uh, Afghanistan will go. But I think with a strong message has been sent that the two countries are linked together in such a way that fighting the insurgency insurgency has to be connected to Pakistan. There's one rule in beating any insurgency, and this is what I teach here to officers from the U.S. Armed Forces and in 
international uh, offices that the lifeblood of any insurgency is its escape route, is its resupply route. And that escape route right now is into Pakistan. And we have to deal with the fact that that is where they regroup, they retrain, they resupply, and Afghanistan will continue to suffer from violence internally until something is done about that. Pakistan has started to realize the cost to its own stability, and now the president has sent a, a message, perhaps not strong enough, that we understand that as well. Okay, um, Mr. Yassini, in his speech, there wasn't much reference to the Taliban, weren't a great deal of, uh, great many references to the Taliban. What's that all about? Do you think he's uh, opening the door to negotiations in a greater way than he has before? Well, I think there, so far there is not tangible uh, process that we can we we, we 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 could have seen it in the in the uh, near past, uh, and that's lacking. And that was mainly the capacity uh, uh, in Kabul. There was lack of capacity in Kabul. Uh, also, the international community did not pay enough attention to the negotiation. It does need, uh, um, uh, as I said, a tangible uh, process. It does need uh, capacity. It does need the. Uh, uh, dedication and determination. Uh, I think militarily it will be very difficult and even impossible to get in uh, a military military into this war. So uh, we have to have a dialogue with uh, with Pakistan, and that dialogue has to be initiated by uh, by Kabul here first, supported by the international community, uh, with special respect to the Islamic world, uh, particularly the Saudi Arabia, can uh, play an important role uh, in order to to carry on with this dialogue in that dialogue is must we 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 have to to launch it as soon uh, as possible president karzai said that on his inaugural speech that uh, but the point is that uh, um, um, people who are capable to run this organization who is leading the negotiation between the international community afghanistan from one side and taliban from another side there has to be capable team for that and there have to be desire for that and, and still we're looking for the implementation if there is only wording that will uh, uh, further uh, make water dirty and muddy and, and, and there'll be no result. Okay, we just uh, let me bring in uh, Chirab and I we're just running towards the well, end of I the program what he now. Said, which, uh, go ahead. Wh what Obama said that I think was extremely important, he made clear that our definition of negotiating with the Taliban was that if there were elements within the Taliban who were willing to renounce the Taliban values, we were going to open the door to reintegrating them into Afghan society and to talking with them and making that possible for them, but not that we were going to strike some sort of a deal with the Taliban itself. And that's an important distinction, and he made that very clear, so I was pleased to hear that. Okay, uh, Mr. Gorka, I just want to put this to you. It's, it's and an he also thought, said that we it? were, he emphasized that we were going to. No, okay, your he final point, Joe, very briefly. We were going to remain focused on our values. My final point, I'd like to get back to those tribal issues because that tribal structure and that warlordism is what got Afghanistan to its catastrophic point today. So, yes, we may have to work with those leaders because they're in place, but we have to sideline them at the same time and work with the new and better forces in the country. Okay, uh, finally, Mr. Gorka, it's an interesting. Thing to peruse an interesting thought. Uh, President Obama set, of course, to receive the Nobel Peace Prize in a matter of days, and he's just escalated a war, hasn't he? <laughs> I have to respond to the last point. To say that the tribal system in Afghanistan is responsible for the violence is an affront to uh, Afghan culture and history. I think we can't blame the tribes for the civil war, for the Soviet invasion, and for the Taliban and for Al Qaeda. When it comes to the Nobel Peace Prize, I'd prefer it if they'd wait a few years and see whether he actually makes a contribution to world peace. Uh, the gentlemanly thing would be to not accept the reward. Okay, uh, Cheryl, just very, very briefly, you've got about 20 seconds to have your say to that. The, the tribal structures Hello? are based on, on elitism, on privilege, on, on not on justice or merits. They lead to nepotism and corruption, and they have led to poverty and underdevelopment, and obviously they're not the way forward in the future for, for any country, including Afghanistan. Okay, Cheryl Bernard, Mr. Gorka, Sebastian Gorka, Marwes Yassini, thank you very much indeed for your time and thanks for watching Inside Story. Uh, as ever, please email any comments or thoughts. We always like to hear from you, of course. Just email to Al InsideStory at aljazeera.net. From me, Nick Clark, it's goodbye.